Okay, in this video I'm going over some behavioral economics concepts and how they relate to the microeconomic modeling. So, um, to begin with, let's set up the basic properties of microeconomic modeling and then we'll talk about each behavioral economics concept and how it modifies the classic structure in microeconomic modeling. So, um, to begin with, we have our choice variable, whatever that is, and that's part of a choice set. And oftentimes the choice set is um, somewhat obvious, like if you're, if you're choosing a percentage of your budget to devote to coffee, for example, then the choice set has to be between 0 and 100%. You know that there's restrictions on what your choice set can be, and of course that's going to be um, behavioral economics may modify what we perceive our choice set to be. Um, now, how do we handle uncertainty in microeconomic modeling? We do that with expected value. So if there's a certain percent chance it's going to rain, 50 per, or 40 percent chance it's going to rain, we multiply the probability of rain times the utility if, if it does rain. And then the probability that it will shine times our utility if it will shine, so we have expected value as another key property of microeconomic modeling that may be modified through some behavioral economics concepts. And of course we have benefits and costs, and here I have utility and the cost of whatever decision it might be. And you can always place importance weights on any of these concepts. Maybe some people emphasize the cost more, some people emphasize the benefit more, and adding importance weights is as simple as just adding an importance coefficient before a particular term in your objective function. And then finally, how do we handle time? In economic modeling, we do that through discounting. Um, the classic discounting is uh, whatever your utility is over 1 plus r, if it's one period in the future, and 1 plus r squared if it's two periods in the future. So we have classic time discounting here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and add a second period just to remind ourselves that this um, 1 plus r gets squared and then cubed as we move farther into the future. And then I've added a couple of exogenous variables into our model. These are just things that do not respond to the choice variable, um, but they can influence the relationship between utility and our choice variable. So they'll end up influencing the final decision. Um, so of course, we can put exogenous variables wherever we want. As a matter of fact, our importance weight is an exogenous variable in this model. R, the rate of return, is also an exogenous variable. But I've just stuck a couple of extra ones in to, to help make some points as we're talking about behavioral economics. So, um, when we think about behavioral economics, there's a few big umbrella categories that will modify this, and the most important is probably prospect theory. And prospect theory really just gives us a particular shape of utility functions that um, extends into the negative realm. And then there's different properties of prospect theory. I have another video that goes over that. Um, but basically, one feature of prospect theory is loss aversion, the fact that um, psychologists have shown empirically that people hate losses much more than they love gains. So our utility function will have a, a bigger negative slope in the third quadrant, in this negative quadrant, than it will in the positive quadrant. That's one feature is loss aversion. Another feature is reference dependence, the fact that um, whether something is a loss or a gain depends on what your reference point is. And sometimes the reference point is how much you have, and whether you're getting stuff or losing stuff, and sometimes the reference point, this point at the origin, is how much you expect. Um, so it could be that you're getting more each year, but if you expected to get more than you got, you'll still experience that as a loss. So this reference point and the fact that there's a kink in the utility function at that reference point, that's going to be important with prospect theory. And then the other feature of prospect theory is just the fact that um, we are risk averse in the positive realm and risk seeking in the negative realm, and that shows up in the type of curvature on this graph. So that's the first thing that um, is one of the most important uh, contributions of behavioral economics to modifying our 
classic microeconomic model, and that's simply going to show up um, as a change in the shape of the utility function. That's all it is. Now our second, um, maybe I'll use red, our second big concept that behavioral economics add to this model has to do with time discounting. Um, in particular, it's going to be time inconsistency. All right, so time inconsistency is going to capture, um, it's going to capture a lot of concepts that have to do with regret. You do something now and you regret it later. It'll capture um, procrastination. It'll capture compulsive overeating. It's basically where you overweight the value of right now and you underweight the future. And how do behavioral economists do this? We do this through something called hyperbolic discounting or beta delta discounting, um, which is basically adding this term beta for any time period that's not today. And so, um, you actually just simply add any future time period is going to be discounted at a higher rate, beta, where beta is less than 1, and I think of beta as being a haze over the future. Um, and you actually cannot get some of these results without adding this beta in. If you just have 1 over 1 plus r, which is equal to delta, Delta is classic discounting. It's the beta term, this haze over the future, the discounting of the future, which doesn't change. It's just simply separating right now, which is really important. It's right now is the time when we experience our, mo our emotions. And so right now, everything is way more um, salient, way more important. It's separating right now from any time period in the future. So um, that concept actually requires probably a longer video to explain, but basically, um, time inconsistency captures behaviors that cannot be captured through regular discounting, which include uh, procrastination, compulsive eating, and regret. So number two, time discounting, this is going to modify um, the time element in our classic model. Now the next, uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is social preferences. So behavioral economics adds social preferences, the fact that we care about other people's utility. So social preferences includes things like altruism, that's where you get positive utility for other people's positive utility. It includes spite, which is where you actually get positive utility from other people's negative utility. It includes reciprocity, the fact that um, a lot of times you feel altruistic towards people who are nice to you and you feel spite toward people who are mean to you and you can build that into a model which is really fun. Inequality aversion is another um, thing under the subcategory of social preferences and of course social preferences are anytime we have um, other people's utility built into our utility function. So, Number three, social preferences, also is going to modify how we construct our utility functions in our, um, in our classic uh, microeconomic model. Now, the next one I'd like to talk about is going to be, um, is going to be salience. And salience is basically, it has to do with importance weights or probabilities. So salience um, relates to the importance weight or the probabilities. And it basically gets at the idea that um, what we're optimizing can become biased based on things that are more salient. So if you, uh, if you have stronger emotions associated with something, it's going to, you might put a heavier importance weight on it, or you might overestimate the, the probability that it'll happen. Um, if you're afraid of something, you might... Uh, like if you're afraid of cancer, you may overestimate the probability you get cancer and therefore you may um, pay a lot more money for cancer insurance than, than would be rational if you, um, if you accurately adjust, uh, if you accurately estimated the probability of getting cancer. That's just very emotional. Um, but it's not just emotions. It can be how frequently do you encounter something. Um, if you encounter something more frequently than uh, other people are more frequently than it's 
actual probability of happening that could lead to you overestimating the probability or overweighting the importance of that thing in your decision making. Um, with salience, advertising of course is going to try to get us to increase the salience of certain things in our decision making. Salience is just a really important concept that's going to adjust how heavily we weigh certain costs and certain benefits when we're optimizing during our decision making. So anchoring has to do with the fact that sometimes our, when we make decisions, we don't know how to calcibrate. So we use anchors to try to help us calcibrate what sh the value of things and what things should be. And of course, advertisers are going to try to influence our anchoring. The classic example here is sometimes stores will have three different types of TV and nobody buys the expensive TV, but when you walk into the TV store, you don't really know how much should you be paying for a TV, how much is it worth? And so you see three options and research says a lot of times people will go with the middle option. So by having a really high priced expensive item, that makes you more likely to choose the middle priced item over the, the cheapest item because you're like at least I'm getting kind of in the middle at least I'm not paying that high price of the expensive TV in which case the expensive TV is there simply to anchor your decision um, and of course an anchor is going to be an exogenous variable in the model now I should point out some of these concepts are interconnected because of course the reference point in prospect theory is an anchor um, if you have a reference point that isn't how much you have, maybe it's your expectation, or maybe it's so something else um, that's determining what you consider to be zero, what you consider to be positive, and what you consider to be negative, in which case an anchor is part of prospect theory, but um, it's also a separate concept and doesn't have to be part of prospect theory, it's just sometimes, um, sometimes an important part. So mental accounting is where we have different bins in our head for different types of spending. Um, for example, we might have a certain amount of money that we sort of think we'll spend this much on entertainment per, per month, and, um, and we try to keep that separate from our food budget in our head. And of course, those are arbitrary separations that we've made when, through, through our budgeting process but they could influence how we actually spend and how we make decisions. So um, mental accounting is another force that can come into play when we are, um, when we're making our decisions. And it can come into play in a number of ways, but one of those is the choice set. If you've decided I have exactly $200 to spend on entertainment per month or exactly 400 on food, and you're making a decision within that budget, you're sort of artificially forcing a choice set on yourself, which could be good, it could be good and healthy for self-control, but there's also very, um, some irrational types of mental accounting. For example, when you win money, people put that win, that money that they want in a different mental account where they tend to spend it much more frivolously than money they actually earned. And then similarly, if you inherit money because of the death of a loved one, you tend to have a mental account for that money that's very serious and important, like you wouldn't spend money you got from a relative's death on uh, frivolous meals and, um, and toys, you're probably going to spend it on something a little bit more serious. So um, mental accounting relates partially to the choice set, the choice set that you view as, um, as what you have to work with here. And of course, this can relate to how you partition your budget. Um, so that's mental accounting, and there's a lot more uh, behind that, but I'm just giving an overview of how some of these behavioral economics concepts are connected to the microeconomic model. Um, then there's law of small numbers. And law of small numbers is also going to relate to the probabilities. I'll use this probability here. Um, Basically, when we come up with estimates of probabilities to help us make decisions, those estimates may be biased based on what we've experienced. So if we happen to know um, two people who died in a motorcycle accident, then we may way overestimate the probability of someone dying in a motorcycle accident. That's a, uh, just based on our sample size, happens to have a biased percentage of people who died in that, in which case we may get 
biases in the way we think about decision making. So, and there's a lot more to law of small numbers as well. Okay, diagnostic utility is a pretty useful concept. It's, um, diagnostic utility is basically self-esteem utility. It's us doing something because by doing that, it diagnoses us as a certain type of person. And one example here is running in the rain. Maybe you don't get utility out of running in the rain. Uh, it's a really bad experience. The, the one day it's raining, not running on that day doesn't really make that big of a difference in terms of your health. But you still run in the rain because you want to make sure you want to believe that you are the type of person who does run in the rain. So it's basically, you want to diagnose yourself as a resilient, uh, hardcore person by running in the rain. So your decision is to run even when it's raining because of the way that diagnoses you. And of course, there's lots of things you may do because it increases your self-esteem. It sort of makes you feel that you are a type of person. And you may make choices to signal to yourself, self-signaling is another behavioral economics concept, that, that you are the type of person to do that. So diagnostic utility, of course, is an adjustment on the utility function. And then another behavioral economics concept that comes up is framing. Framing is just how do you frame the decisions that you actually make. And the example I like to use here is um, you could set up a maximization problem that's how much coffee should I buy today? And that's a decision, it's got costs and benefits, you could model it pretty easily. And then a different decision that you could set up to model is how much should I budget in my, my budget for coffee this year? And once again, you could model that easily. There's costs and benefits. Um, it's a different frame on the same decision. And as you might imagine, you're going to get very different decisions being made looking at those two decisions, even though they're both cost-benefit analyses. So the way you frame a particular problem, the way you set it up, the way a person approaches their decision-making and what they perceive to be the costs and benefits and the decisions that need to be made and the choice uh, set that, that they view as within, their, within the realm of possibility, that's going to influence the actual choices they make. So that's framing. And I think I'll stop there. There's more to behavioral economics, obviously, but I just wanted to give you a taste for the way that the classic economic model gets adjusted as we build in these um, irrationalities, if you can even call them irrationalities, that make our models more nuanced and, in some cases, more accurate.